The year is 1591. Don Genoso Coppolo, now part of Don Lewis's expedition, returned to the land of Itui once again. This time, the stakes are higher, the mission more perilous. As they march deeper into the mountains, they pass by an Igorot hut. The outer walls of the hut are adorned with severed heads, a grim reminder of the tribe's headhunting tradition. The sight triggers a flashback in Don Dinoso. He remembers a childhood trading expedition with his father, where he met his first Igorot. The chief's face was tattooed, his teeth filed to a point. The chief had offered two severed heads as a gift to his father. The casual manner in which the chief treated these heads had terrified the young Genoso. But what his father was really after was the gold bracelets, a symbol of wealth and power. To the chief, the gold meant little. He traded for a few blankets, a simple exchange that left a lasting impression on Don Dinoso. The complexities of Itui were deeply ingrained in him from that young age. Don Lewis, accompanied by a contingent of 70 to 80 Spanish soldiers and numerous Indian chiefs from La Panga, set forth on a journey that would etch itself into the annals of history. Upon reaching the River Tui, today known as the Magut River, the gateway to the province, Don Lewis ordered a cross to be erected on a tree. He thanked God and took possession of the land in the name of His Majesty on July 15, 1591. The following day, Don Lewis approached the inhabitants of the village of Tui. With a blend of diplomacy and gifts, pieces of cloth, garments, beads, and combs, he won their allegiance. The villagers swore peace in a unique ceremony involving an egg. Both parties threw eggs to the ground, symbolizing that just as the eggs were broken, so too would they be if they broke their promises. After securing the allegiance of the village of Tui, Don Lewis felt emboldened to extend his sphere of influence. He summoned the chiefs of the nearby villages, Bantai, Bugai, and Barat, to a grand assembly. The atmosphere was thick with anticipation. As the chiefs arise, their eyes a mix of curiosity and caution. Don Lewis, ever the strategist, knew that to control a land, one must also secure the hearts of its people. He ordered the chiefs to bring their wives down from the mountains, aiming to integrate them into the newly conquered society. But the chiefs declined, offering a vague excuse that their wives were resting in another village. This was the first crack in the veneer of peace, a subtle act of defiance that did not go unnoticed. Then emerged Chief Tui, a figure of imposing stature and indomitable will. Named after the land itself, Tui was a chief who had not participated in the initial peace treaty. He was a man of strong convictions, and he had no intentions of bending the knee to a foreign invader. Chief Tui openly criticized the peace treaty, his voice a thunderous echo that reverberated through the assembly. Why do you barter away our freedoms for trinkets and empty promises, he roared. His words were like a spark in a parched forest, and they ignited the flames of rebellion. The villagers, emboldened by Tui's defiance, broke the fragile peace. Hostilities erupted, culminating in the burning of the village of Tui, a blaze that consumed not just wood and straw, but also the illusion of easy conquest for Don Lewis. The fire that raised the village was not just a physical act of destruction. It was a symbolic annihilation of the false harmony that Don Lewis had believed he established. It was a message, loud and clear, that the people of Tui, under the leadership of Chief Tui, would not be so easily subdued. The defiance of Chief Tui marked a significant turning point in Don Lewis's expedition. It was the moment that exposed the fragility of foreign-imposed peace and the indomitable spirit of a people unwilling to be conquered. Don Lewis would continue his expedition, discovering villages of varying sizes. He also learned of two other providence. The chiefs of these villages begged for pardon and swore another oath, this time involving candles. They promised to pay tribute, extinguishing the candles as a symbol of the fate that would befall oath breakers. While in Dunglai, 
Don Lewis's expedition ran out of provisions. The local populace, sensing vulnerability, turned against him, and communications with Manila went ominously silent. Growing increasingly anxious, Don Lewis's father, Gomez Perez das Marinas, had not heard from his son in over a month. Fearing the worst, he mobilized another army to locate his missing son. In our next episode, we will delve into the gripping saga of Don Francisco's desperate search for Don Lewis.